This is Airing Pain, a programme brought to you by Pain Concern, the UK charity providing information and support for those of us living with pain and for healthcare professionals. I'm Paul Evans, and this is the second in a series of programmes about Complex Regional Pain Syndrome, or CRPS. It's funded by grants from the RS Macdonald Charitable Trust and the Hospital Saturday Fund. In the previous edition of Airing Pain, that's number 94, which you can download from the Pain Concern website, we established that CRPS is a condition in which a person experiences persistent, severe and debilitating pain, which is usually confined to one limb but can spread to other parts of the body. The skin of the affected body part can become so sensitive that just a slight touch, bump or even a change in temperature can provoke intense pain. Professor Candy McCabe is the clinical lead for the National Centre for the Management of CRPS at the Royal National Hospital for Rheumatic Diseases in Bath. I'll just remind you about what she said about a new approach to managing CRPS they're adopting with their patients. Try and access that information underneath the pain. Because it's there, try and find it. And it's really extraordinary how people can suddenly find that information that they thought was lost to them. And lo and behold, you start to shift the focus away from pain into more normal sensations. So we're just starting out on this journey. Um, it's still very experimental, but it intuitively feels the right thing to do. It's really exciting, really exciting. Such enthusiasm can't go unchecked. So I went along to the National Centre for the Management of CRPS in Bath, where senior physiotherapist Emma Houlihan was working with CRPS patient Chris Jones. And again, just trying to remind yourself what was so nice about it. And that nice feeling of just being there with your brother and your sister. And it was a stone wall you were sitting on, wasn't it? Yeah. And just trying to remember how you could just let everything go when you're sitting on that wall. Can you get that sense of just letting go on the right side? Can you remember how that felt? You can see, um, just basically kicking this this leg around. Mm -hmm. So this is a memory from when you were younger. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it's still a nice memory. It's still a nice memory. Yeah. We still do that. Do you? Yeah. I can't really do it much now. You know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we'll get back to Chris and Emma later. In the meantime, let's find out more about the CRPS rehabilitation programme in Bath. Charlie Ewersmith is clinical specialist occupational therapist on the team. It's a great programme. We're really proud of how it's developed. Uh, it's developed over a number of years, but basically people come here for two weeks and they live with us. They stay with us for the two weeks in the hospital here and have a full programme of activities. So every day they'll have physiotherapy, They'll have occupational therapy and hydrotherapy and we have access to psychologists and we have a mixture really of one-to-one -one sessions and workshops which are kind of short and sweet half hour sessions on things like managing your sleep or nutrition, all kinds of different things like that. And then longer group sessions which can be anything about understanding CRPS to understanding how to communicate with people about pain thinking about how to manage your own levels of activity, get more in control of life again. Um, so it's a, a really broad ranging programme. We do relaxation every day because we found that it's really important to help people dampen down their nervous system um, within treating CRPS. And that's really helpful because then people can carry on and do that themselves when they leave us. So it's a great programme, it's quite intense, but people get a lot out of it. My name's um, Michael Cannell. I'm 56 years old. My name's Julie Morris and I'm 46. We're on day four of your CRPS rehabilitation programme in Bath. How did you get CRPS? I got thrown from a horse. And it was from there I had lots and lots of operations and it just caused it, basically. And for want of a better term, what does it feel like? Very painful, horrendous, and people just don't believe you because they can't see anything. That's fairly common with chronic pain conditions, isn't it? Is the pain is mm. invisible. Yeah, I think if, if I'd got my arm in a sling, it would be better. 
people would think, oh, I'll stay away from her, but because they can't see anything, you just have so many people touch her and it's just so painful. And then they can't work out why that was so painful because it was only just a little touch and it shouldn't have hurt. Mine was an accident at work. Uh, it was it's something as simple as just changing a water bottle, one of the bigger ones. It pulled a muscle off of my arm. The operation went fine, but they had to keep it in a plaster cast for three months for the first period and then another three months to allow the muscle to grow back on. When they took the plaster cast off, it just felt like it was still on there. And then I started to get some really bad feelings on my skin of it being red hot, freezing cold, no sense to it whatsoever, swelling up. My arm used to swell really, really big and obviously cause you pain from the swelling because it used to give you different types of pain throughout your arm to start with and then it's settled itself now to um, the lower part of my arm but it spread into my face, back and right leg now through that one simple accident. But again, as um, Judy said, it's very difficult to explain to people. Constant pain, the constant swelling, you just can't get it out of your head. It's just there all the time. It's almost like somebody's put a massive bunch, of, for me, of chain mail on one side. My name is Jane Hall and I'm a clinical specialist physiotherapist with the CRPS service at the Royal National Hospital for Rheumatic Diseases. So at a new patient appointment, they will see um, Dr. Brooke, who's our pain consultant, and Professor Candy McCabe, who's our clinical lead. They will confirm or refute the diagnosis of CRPS because quite often we get sent patients who don't actually have CRPS. They may have something completely different, like fibromyalgia. And because we've seen so many patients with CRPS, we're quite good at knowing who's got CRPS and who hasn't. So at that appointment, patients will be given a diagnosis or a different diagnosis may be given, or will say, actually, you know what, we don't know. We need to refer you on to a different specialist, but it's not CRPS. If it is CRPS, then patients will be invited to come back and see us in about six to eight weeks to an appointment where they will see myself as a physiotherapist or my colleague who has a similar position to me as an occupational therapist alongside our psychologist. And we will assess how the patient has engaged with any of the initial recommendations that were given in the first programme. But equally, it's not just our decision. Crucially, it's the patient's decision. Do they want to come? And for them to know if they want to come, they need to understand what they're coming to. So we spend a lot of time explaining about what we do here. And we give them a leaflet which tells them about the programme very often they will have read this online before they come and we often ask them to have a look at our YouTube video which talks about the programme so that they can make as informed a decision as possible about coming. I'll give you all the details about where to find this information on the CRPS Rehabilitation Programme in Bath later in the programme. Now, at this point, I'll just remind you of the small print that whilst we in Pain Concern believe the information and opinions on airing pain are accurate and sound based on the best judgments available, you should always consult your health professional on any matter relating to your health and well-being. He or she is the only person who knows you, your circumstances, and therefore the appropriate action to take on your behalf. And don't forget that you can download all editions and transcripts of Airing Pain from Pain Concern's website, which is painconcern.org.uk. And there you'll find information and support for those of us with chronic pain, our families and carers, and for healthcare professionals. There's also information on how to order Pain Concern's magazine, Pain Matters. Now, back to Chris Jones, who's with Senior Physiotherapist of the National Centre for the Management of CRPS, yeah. Emma Houlihan. Not playing ball. Quite hot. Did you have the goal of using that memory? Yeah, and I tried it um, 
this morning and last night and whatever that touch was is still invigorated. So good, still good. Good. Nice. Yeah, it's always getting sort of like, you know, the goose pimples in the side of her face and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So. But I mean, that's good. It, if it's a different sensation yeah. to what you're normally getting, and it doesn't sound like it's massively unpleasant, is that right? or is It's it... not massively unpleasant, no. It's just, um, it's unknown. Yeah. I've not had that sensation. Or yeah. I don't actually recognise that yeah, yeah. sensation. We know that you have difficulties knowing what's happening on the left side, especially in your leg, which is what we're focusing on now. So I'll just talk about your leg for the moment. Um, and what we're trying to do is to change some of the sensation that he's experiencing. So at the moment, you're just experiencing lots of weird things and you don't, yeah. you don't really know what's going on with that well, side. It's, it's new. It's all yeah. new. What are you feeling? I've, I don't really connect with the leg at all. I don't have any. It's all dissociated. So, in order, you know, to feel a new sensation that I haven't felt for seven years is mind-boggling to me. So, this is a new sensation that you're feeling since coming to the rehab program. Yeah, and it's exciting on one hand, but it's also there's anticipation on the other as to what's next or how I respond to that sensation, which yesterday was building this morning. You know, that tearful mm. sensation. And that can be really common with these yeah. kinds of things. So we're doing lots of work around trying to use um, memories of how things felt in the past. So how just trying to retrain how to feel, I suppose. And um, so we do use memory work around how did it feel before to try and retrain the nervous system to search for more normal sensations and to recall those more normal sensations as opposed to just you experiencing lots of just weird and wonderful, well not wonderful, weird and really uncomfortable sensations on your left side. So yeah, and it, it can be quite emotional and actually that can, that can help. I think that's where I've been building since this morning. Yeah, yeah. So I'm sort of like not connecting with the group properly and just wanting to I'll take a bit of time out just to make sense of yeah, what's yeah. been happening. Yeah, it's really common to feel like this and to feel yeah. a bit funny about it all and just be wondering like what the hell is going on. So just explain to me, in the last edition of Airing Pen, I spoke to Candy McCabe about this process of tricking the brain mm. to re remember yeah. what it was like before. When we're doing this, we're, it's not really trying to trick the brain as such, it's just trying to get the brain to re-engage with this side of the body and just trying to get the brain to recall how normal sensations felt and trying to bring that into the present day. So we do a lot of work of you're trying to remember how it felt to sit on this yeah. wall and it was a really nice memory because you're there with family members, yeah. yeah. And because it's such a clear memory, I suppose you're telling the nervous system, this is how it felt, this is how it should feel, and trying to bring that kind of to the forefront of your mind, so bring it into the present day. It might sound like it's a really psychologically heavy technique, but it's, it's just trying to get the brain to search for more normal sensations and to remember what normal feels like. Yeah, because I don't see parts of my body you know, if I shut my eyes and try and remember what the body looks like, I don't see that. So these new twitches and connections that I'm trying to make right now is is unnatural. I don't understand what you mean by you, you, you can't see but your I, body. I cannot picture the left hand side of the body. If I shut my eyes and try and think about what it looks like, I can't picture that. There's, there's limbs missing, there's parts of things missing. So to try and connect with the leg that doesn't actually fit into my memory, then it's unnatural. I wonder do people come here who are jaded in that this is just another island I've been pushed from one to the other, that they could come jaded or they could come really buoyed up. This is it. Yeah. I've arrived. So we get both and it's about managing expectations. So when patients are very buoyed up because they have been referred to the National Specialist Centre for CRPS, they come with very, very high expectations, which usually involve, I hope they are going to cure me. And we have to help patients manage those expectations because unfortunately we can't offer a cure. We can teach patients ways of managing their condition better. Equally, when patients come very jaded, they often feel, what is the point of coming? So again, we encourage them to look at our information and say, you know, what have you got to lose by trying it? Come and see what you think. 
generally, I would say of the patients we see, about 80 to 90 percent will come on programme. Sometimes we get patients though who, who don't really need to come on the programme because they've had fantastic local input and the severity or the impact of their condition means that there wouldn't be a, an awful lot for us to do on programme. And so those patients are managed in the outpatient clinic. And generally what we do is teach the patient what they need to go away and do and then ask the patient to come back and see us maybe three months or six months later, having put into place these different aspects and see how they get on. And that can work really successfully. Tell me what state you were when you came in and what state you hope you'll be in six days time. I came in in a slightly negative state just because of past experiences and I didn't know whether or not these could put me in a, a positive frame of mind. But I'm giving it all I've got and I've made some progress and I will continue to make progress and the hardest part is going to be putting a flat foot on the floor but I think we'll make that in the next week. Yeah, I mean, there's every chance, isn't it? It's a, it is a changeable condition, so it's really important to keep that in mind, and I think you're making loads of really good progress, and it is possible, and it's just taking it day by day and really just trying to pace things and give things a go and keep an open mind with it, because some of the things seem a bit weird, don't they? But when you, like some of the techniques used here are a bit strange, but you're going to have to crack on with, I'm yes. afraid. <laughs> Moving on to now, or rather four days ago, when you started this rehab programme, what were your expectations? Mine are just like basic things. I just want them to show me ways to, to manage the pain more, on, you know, on practical levels, just to do my own hair. I know it sounds really silly, but it's just, you get your independence back then, because you can get yourself up and out. Yeah. You know, I'm reliant on somebody all the while, that was my aim, to manage it, because it, you don't, you, and then it makes it worse because you get stressed because you're in pain, and then that makes the pain worse. So I think it's slightly easier for a man because, okay, I might occasionally get the wife to uh, wash my back or something if it's a bit difficult for me in the shower, because it is difficult mm. for you to just get water to touch your skin. Yeah, water is a killer on your skin. Yeah. It really hurts. Yeah. I was just talking with Julie, who was saying, talking about showering, mm -hmm. which I can't remember the exact word she used, but basically mm -hmm. it is terrible. I mean, how would you help somebody like that? Well, that's probably where I would hand over to Kerry, who is our specialist physiotherapist. I've never heard the buck shifted so fast. Well, no. <laughs> no, but it's, I mean, it is the way we work. Yeah. So um, we are within a sort of interdisciplinary model and we work very, very closely, probably more closely than in even a lot of multidisciplinary team environments. There's a huge amount of overlap in what we do between in terms of OT and physio. We kind of don't think of it as stepping on each other's toes. We think about it as very much enhancing what each other do and so we'll constantly be talking about how we can complement the treatments so with something like that it might immediately appear to be a very functional issue which people might think oh that's OT completely um, and some of it might be so we may have some involvement from the occupational therapist down in hydrotherapy for example helping um, with practical side of showering and, and helping to improve it from that perspective but also we would work, and I know you spoke to Emma early on a little bit about our neurocognitive approach that we use. So we could, along with the OTs, use various forms of desensitization, along with a neurocognitive approach to help improve the patient's perception of water. So usually when someone's struggling with water in terms of experiencing that as a painful stimulus, it's when they have CRPS, it's because they're perception of contact from water is altered so we know that the contact from water shouldn't be a painful stimulation but for them it's often experienced in a painful way um, and that's because they're misperceiving that contact so we would work using the neurocognitive process in order to improve the way that they perceive that and to try and normalize it so basically teaching their nervous system to experience water in a normal way again 
and we would use that process, that therapeutic process, as physios, but also working closely with the OTs to kind of integrate those techniques into everything that the patient's doing. And it may not be that water is quite a complicated one. So actually for somebody like Judy, we might not actually start with water. We'd probably start in another way, but it would be very much working towards achieving that as a goal for her. I made the faux pas earlier of calling what Emma was doing a talking therapy, a psychological approach. Mm. I was corrected. <laughs> What's Good. the difference between psychological approach and a mm. neurocognitive approach? Again, there's an overlap, and I wouldn't want to say that there's no psychological aspect to that at all, because of course there is with anything that you do in that way, going to be an, a psychological element to it. I think the way we like to think about it is it's not about using psychology to change how you feel about things. Reducing someone's anxiety about, for example, a particular contact, if we were talking about contact with water, will help, of course, if someone's more comfortable with the idea of being touched with water, less anxious about it, then that is going to mean they have a better neurological experience of it. And we know that from the literature as well, that if you can it, it reduce someone's anxiety about something, you'll change not just their beha behaviour, but actually their experiences and how they feel. But the neurocognitive approach is more than that. It's actually changing your nervous system's ability to perceive things. It's working with your nervous system, not just your brain, in terms of your psychological side, the psychological side of things. How is that? Not sure. <laughs> that's wanting to go into some sort of spasm. Yeah, that's okay. Well, it's not okay, but it's, it can happen with this. Try to control it from the knee down. Mm -hmm. So what was happening with that memory? I think just sitting on the edge of that bridge. Mm -hmm. It was a memory, it was way, way back. Okay. I could see, just, just you know, just gently kicking mm. the right leg about. Yeah. But nothing from there. So what did you feel in your, on your left side there? It's sort of like a, a nerve twitch, but I've, I haven't had, ever had that sensation. Wow. Not for the last seven, seven a bit years. And that's quite scary for me because it, it, it means that something is, is engaging. And to me, that's quite overwhelming. I can feel myself getting slightly upset about it because it's like a new sensation. Mm -hmm. And to have been in this position for the last few years, it's just, it's quite overwhelming. As Emma was working with Chris, who has no sensation or feels his left hand side is not there. Mm -hmm. I did the, what I call visualization to what he was doing, taking me back to a, a place where I was very happy. Mm. Now I saw that as visualization, mm. but he had a physical mm -hmm. reaction to it, where I just had a feel good. That's really you know. important differentiation to make actually that you've picked up. It's not a visualization. Often patients will start with the visual aspect. So if you were to do it as a relaxation or a meditation, you would focus on less possibly the visual side of things. For neurocognitive approaches, it's really important that you focus on the sensory aspect so focusing on what you actually physically experienced and sensed within that memory. So again, you've got the psychological aspect of the fact that it may have been a very relaxing, pleasurable experience, but equally we really need people to focus in on what they're experiencing from a sensory point of view. And that's really what defines it and makes the sensory memory effective in this technique. So the sensory aspect is more important than the kind of how it, the memory made you feel or being able to visualize it. You can start off with that, but we have to very quickly guide the patient to the sensory aspect of it and the physical experience. Patients could spend a fortnight here and in this environment, they could be really enthused and with, with your support and the support of all the staff here, it, it, it's, it's a fantastic facility. And on that second Friday, do you pull the rug out from underneath them and say, you're on your own? So, I mean, patients, know what to expect. We warn patients that when they go home, they lose that cocoon-like experience where everybody understood them. And that can be quite hard for patients. So we warn them that quite often their mood can go down after they've been here. But we also hope that we have given them sufficient self-management tools that they know how to get back out of that. And don't forget, They've been with six or seven, eight other patients who have a similar condition who they've bonded with over the two weeks. And we're quite keen for them to use that social support network to help them. 
They also have the CRPS website, which my colleagues, Dr. Jenny Lewis and Lisa Buckle were responsible for, um, although the team obviously um, helped. Um, so the CRPS website allows our patients to log on and effectively recreate their two week programme with the information and the videos that are on that site. So they can listen to Charlie giving a relaxation tape from the comfort of their own home. They can see myself doing Qigong with Kerry. So we very much encourage patients to go on that website. They also know that they are coming back to see us at a three month review appointment where we evaluate how they've got on with all the information that we gave them on program and help them to set new goals. So you're not throwing them to the wolves? We're not throwing them to the wolves at all. After three months, patients are invited to come back and see us at a six month review. At that stage, we're generally saying to patients, okay, well, you know, we've taught you what you need to know. Here's the CRPS website, which, you know, it's your choice to use or not. We think you're ready to fly on your own now. So let's give you a little bit of support of that and do kind of graduated handholding. And let's transfer you to what we call the open access phase of the program. And this phase essentially allows for patient initiated follow up. So it very much puts the onus on the patient to contact us if they feel they need us. That was Jane Hall, and before her we heard physiotherapy clinical specialist Kerry Johnson. Now, those all important links for patients and healthcare professionals. The National Centre for the Management of CRPS is in Bath, and the website is rnhrd.nhs.uk forward slash page forward slash 79. Not very catchy, I know. But if you put CRPS Bath into your search engine, it should get you there. And the CRPS network, also run by the team in Bath, is another excellent resource. And that's at crpsnetworkuk.org. No gaps, crpsnetworkuk.org. Much easier, I think. Don't forget that you can download this and every edition of Airing Pain at painconcern .org.uk and please do leave your comments in the feedback section. I'll leave you with Mike and Julie. These guys, they're absolutely brilliant, the programme they put you through here, because this is, is my second time, because you do get to the stage where um, you can't cope so you have to come back and the programme they set out here is to allow you to pace life and enjoy a little bit of life back and they can only help you cope with the pain, they can't take it away from you and I think that's the first learning curve that you need to learn here which yeah. they really sort of tell you they can take it away as much as they can with drugs living with it and uh, and managing sit it, and managing it? it yeah and learning how to self-manage it correctly yeah. yeah that's absolutely spot on because um, when you walk away from these guys, I mean, you were only here for a short period, but as soon as you walk away from these guys, you're back in the outside world by yourself. The most that we've found is social media networks for opening CRPS up to people. We found so much information on that, and you get to talk to other people that is where you need to go to see how they manage it, what they do, their little tricks. And some of them are absolutely brilliant. You wouldn't have, might not have thought of it yourself, but you know, it's just tiny little stuff. It's good to be here though, because then you just, uh, for a better word, you feel normal yeah. because there's other people and you don't feel as if, oh, you've got to pretend that everything's okay when it's not really. And these guys know that you have a problem. Yeah, that, that makes it feel better. Yeah because they know directly that you've got a problem, full stop. Yeah. They haven't got it themselves, but they see so many people that have got it, they know what you're going through, so. And just believing in you. That's it. <laughs> yeah, just to believe that, you know, it is real. Yeah. It's, it's so good.